You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 14th of March, 2015. Thank you all for tuning in. In this week's show, we're going to return to the topic of homosexuality. And I hope, Lord willing, over the next hour or so, to look at one of the faces, if not the face, of the homosexual movement today, Matthew Vines. Now, Matthew Vines became hugely popular. I don't know when his first video came out. It was a year or two ago, something like that. It was a YouTube video on the homosexual debate and um, on his YouTube channel. Matthew Vines is just known as that. Now, in the video, he goes through various arguments that he has, saying that homosexuality is spoken about, is well, condemned six times in the Bible. Uh, it's not. It's condemned in other places. But we'll just stick with the six he has mentioned, and it is mentioned in other places as well, besides the ones he's mentioned. The ones he, places he's mentioned are Genesis 19, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, I believe, as well. And uh, various other places as well. And the number of passages, which, which I've covered a number of times on the radio show, when probably when dealing with Vicky Beeching, the CCM, quote unquote, Christian artist who came out a few months ago. But I think we have to put this into, into context. We have to understand what homosexuality is. Now, of course, we are all sinners, and we're all, without the blood of Christ, uh, without the shed blood of Christ, without the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God, living the perfect life on the behalf of all those who believe in Him, and shedding His blood to wash away their sins on behalf of His church, we would have nothing. We would be naked before Him. We would be clothed with filthy rags. We know this from the scriptures. The scriptures are quite clear. None seek after God. No, not one. So we're all wretched. None of us have anything to boast of because it's not of ourselves lest any man should boast. Even the faith to believe, to lay hold upon the gospel is not of ourselves. It is the grace of God that saves. None of us can boast. This is all true. But there's something deeply prevalent and destructive and particularly dis- that will destroy places. You can look at, well, you can look at Genesis 19 and Sodom and Gomorrah. And what was the characteristic of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, homosexuality. And I'm going to look at Matthew Vines' video in a minute. He's got a, there's a website that they're running, kind of a group that they're running called the Reformation Project, and also he has a book out. There is a big push, especially on the internet, and people who got, they want people who are studying these topics and coming to the Bible for their answers to the homosexuals want to be ready with all their arguments. Now, and I've often said this before when I've been talking to people and things like that, before I was a Christian, I, I not a whole lot, but I knew a number of homosexuals. I knew people who were involved in that lifestyle. It didn't really bother me at that time. It was only, to be honest, I didn't look at the topic for a few months until I was saved. I remember I was saved three months and someone said to me homosexuality was a sin. And I remember kind of shirking. I was like, mm, I'm not sure about that. And I was saved. I, know, I was definitely saved at the time. I just hadn't studied it, and then I went away and just, I think I spent that night just studying and just going through it and looking at the passages, and I was like, well, it's conclusive. There's no doubt about it. Homosexuality is a sin. It has been condemned in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. There is no positive references to a homosexual Loving relationship in the Bible. Why? Because it doesn't exist. 
it is primarily built on Hollywood fiction. The sad thing is, a lot of people's views on homosexuality, well, those who are outside the church and don't believe the Bible, often it's changed through soap operas, through movies, not actual life, where there is, they will feel sorry for homosexuals. Now, I don't believe, just to make a point, I don't believe that that somebody should be beaten up and bullied and all this kind of thing for any reason. And that's number one. You know, like people talk, oh, well, bullying and this, that, and the other. I've talked to homosexuals as a Christian, and I've answered it like this. Marriage is between one man and one woman for life, and any lustful, and lusting means just to want. See, we can have this lust in a, it's like, oh, but if it's, if it's a wanting in a loving way. No, no. To lust is to want something God has not given you. The original design for marriage was revealed in the Garden of Eden before the fall between one man and one woman for life. Therefore for, shall a man leave his mother and his father and shall cleave unto his wife. And then Jesus reaffirms that when he denounces adultery of the heart later in Matthew chapter 5. So it is quite clear. Across the board, it is shown from the scriptures that homosexuality... Well, here's the thing, right? People say, well, it doesn't say anything about that. No, no. God gives a command. For example, Cain and Abel. Cain offers the fruit of the field. And Abel offers, by faith we learn later in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11 we learn that Abel did this by faith, as in it's the same covenant of grace in the Old and in the New Testament, but just different administrations of the same covenant. But Abel offered according to the pattern, because we are supposed to be followers of God, as Ephesians 5.1 says, that word followers can also be translated imitators. We are to be imitators of God. Imitators, of course, in the communicable attributes. I'm not talking about his om- omnipotence and omnipresence and he's being all-powerful or anything. This is not what we're supposed to be imitators of God in, but in his holiness, in his goodness, in his love, in his mercy. These are the things we are to imitate God in. Now, The, it's almost hard to, it's overwhelming to see it because I think for a number of years, I've, has the Christian church really come to this? And there's a huge swell of liberal churches, often because, well, that's not the entire reason, but because we've thrown off. The, the church of the past. We've thrown off the, the men of old, and we want to reinvent the wheel. And part of this kind of form of maverickism, where we kind of almost say, oh, we're, we're, we're way more pro- progressive than them. We've progressed way more than them. They were wrong, but we're so much better. Now, you only get a Matthew Vines popular when the church or the professing church or whatever you want to call it is apostatizing when they do not by and large know the true God. You see the true sheep leaving once say like a denomination like the PC USA which is going in direction of affirming homosexual marriage. It's very, very close to it. I read an article there recently. I think it was on the Christianity Today. And they're not too many votes away from that. And many people have left the PCUSA over that. And similar things have happened in other denominations, mainline denominations, which have apostatized. And the... And the seeds of the apostasy go back a long, long way. And they don't start with an interpretation, say, necessarily of a particular text, but they start with hearts of unbelief. 
and pride and wanting to be respected by the world. This is what happens in institutions which began the neo-evangelical movement, which I covered in the film of Chaos and Confusion. Where people, the liberal movement, just to comment on the liberal movement, you know, the father of liberalism was known as Friedrich Schleiermacher. He lived about 200 years ago. And there's very much, you could say, almost like an anti-intellectual argument, but not necessarily, where the heart knowledge was so much more important than the head knowledge. And we know from the scriptures that both are important. They both work together. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We cannot have proper apprehension of Christ, laying hold upon Christ, trusting upon Christ, if we don't know him. But it's both intellectual and the emotions and everything else, the whole man. Let's look at this video now by Matthew Vines. Marriage equality is on the rise. But despite this trend, religious beliefs remain... I reject wholeheartedly that title of... Just like the pro... Home, the po, pro... Child murdering abortionists who want to call themselves pro-choice. Well, no one's against choice, are they? It sounds very positive, doesn't it? You don't want to be anti-choice, do you? Rather than, say, you know, like pro-life, pro you know, to be positive. Oh, it's marriage equality. You see, this is not, it's not about equality. Anybody, I say, why would you want to deprive these people of getting married? They can get married if they want to, but they don't want marriage. You see, this is not what they want. They don't want marriage. They want to change the institution of marriage. I don't know, not all of them are aware of this. Some of them are. And change it and destroy it from the inside. I think I did a vlog a couple of months ago where I cover that. And showing, I think the vlog was called Marriage Equality is an Abomination. Something like that. I think it was about four or five months ago I did that video. So you can look it up on the YouTube channel. And I remember... It, this was admitted, I can't remember the lady's name, but she was a prominent leader in the, in the LGBT community, the homosexual rights movement. And I remember she was both Russian and American, so that probably narrows it down, Marsh or something. But this whole, the titles are hugely important. If you define the debate wrongly, you see, we're not talking about marriage equality. Two, you don't have to be a for example, you don't have to be a Christian in order to get married. Now, of course, we hope that people trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, lay hold upon the gospel, that they may flee from the city of destruction and run into the, the saving, all-sufficient Savior. Run to him. We pray that people will do that. But that is not a prerequisite necessary for marriage. Now, at the same time, a, a believer should never marry an unbeliever. But anyway. When we're looking at this issue, it is important to see what is being talked about when we're talking about marriage. Marriage, what is marriage according to the scripture? Between one man and one woman joined together in covenant before God for life. What are they talking about? They are talking about including same-sex couples. Now, what if this changes? Think about this now. So just say this changes. And, oh, well, you know, like marriage equality for the, the couples, the homosexual couples and the lesbian couples, they are now included 
in the legal definition of what marriage is. So this is what's seen as equality. But how about the triplet? How about the the four pair? How about the polygamist? How about it, quote unquote equality for them? And you're saying, no, no, that's that's wrong. It's wrong to be married more, more than one person. And the 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 person who wants to be consistent will ask why. Why is it wrong for three? If you can change the definition here, well, why not keep going? And no, and they will. Why not marry an animal? And I know that is disgusting, but this is the direction it's going. You see, oh, I could rant so much about this issue, but it is a false, it's false nomenclature. It's a false title. It is not marriage equality. That's a joke. It's a redefinition of marriage, not marriage of equality, a redefinition of what marriage is. You are changing the institution, and by changing the institution, you are attempting to destroy something that God has created, an ordinance of God, and God will not be mocked. In a major obstacle to acceptance. Many conservative Christians believe that the Bible condemns all same-sex relationships. That question drove my own intensive study of this issue when I came to terms with being gay. As both my parents and my church in Kansas believed that gay marriage was wrong. But what I learned when I studied the relevant scripture passages changed my parents' minds, along with the views of many other Christians in my life. Just amazing when you think about it, right? Yeah, yeah, the church has been wrong for th- Thousands of years. And Matthew Vines is here to save the day. Where are these great theologians of the past that would agree with you? There are none. And this is another issue of throwing off the past and we just, oh, we got it all wrong before. Look, if what you're seeing in the scriptures is true, it doesn't mean that every godly Christian in every generation will agree with you. Not necessarily, and that is not what I'm saying. But what will happen is you will not be the only person to see it. No, you will not. There are six passages in the Bible that refer to same-sex behavior. Three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. The most famous passage is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends two angels disguised as men into the city of Sodom, where the men of Sodom threaten to rape them. The angels blind the men and God destroys the city. For centuries, this story was interpreted as God's judgment on same-sex relations. But the only form of same-sex behavior described is a threatened gang rape. Ezekiel 16, 49. Anyway, I don't know where to start here. The only mention, think about it, right? The only mention of same-sex relationships, if you want to call it that, is in a negative light. And every time, even if you want to go down this line of argumentation, every place, there's no positive connotation with homosexuality at all. Number one, the design of marriage is one man, one woman for life. Anything outside of that is wrong. It is wrong for the the heterosexual to engage in lustful, sensual, and even sexual relationships outside of the marriage covenant. Homosexuality is even worse because it is against nature, against God's ordained, dev- ordained way of doing things. This homosexuality is rebellion against the, de- the natural law, the, the, the moral law of God. up the story's focus on violence and hostility towards strangers. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. So it's about their hostility towards strangers. Now, I think that's from the NIV, so I'm just going to look at the authorized version in this issue because it's a far superior 
Translation, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 49. Poor and needy. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. Sorry, it's at 1649. I'm left to lose in the reference there. So Ezekiel 1649. Ezekiel 16, 49 reads as follows. Behold, this is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, abundance of idleness, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither does she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Pride. Pride was the problem with Sodom. Agreed. They did not help the poor. Now, this translation, I think it's the NIV. He's going to, but now this is the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant. Arrogant, same as pride, anyway. It's the same thing. Pride. Look, pride is at the center of every sin against God. <laughs> when Adam and Eve fell, what were they thinking? You see, they were told not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan says, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God doth know. So there's an accusation against him. What do they think? Whenever you disobey God, you're saying this. I can do without God. I don't need to listen to God's warnings or advice. I do not need to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not in thine own understanding. No, you're thinking the other way around. So it's pride. It's arrogant. It's stupidity. So at the, at the base, the foundation of every sin is pride. And this is one of the reasons, because it's the root of every sin, and it's the arrogance was the same arrogance which Lucifer fell. And it's not the only sin Lucifer did. He fell in the pride of his heart. He was raised up. He thought he was so much greater than he was. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. It was pride and arrogance. But is the only thing this devil is condemned about is pride? This is the argument Matthew finds is going here that, oh, the only thing, the only thing that was wrong in Sodom was pride. And needy. In Leviticus 18.22... <laughs> so it's just like, well, anyway, he probably goes into it in more detail in his book. How to put this? Homosexuality is mentioned in a pretty poor light there. I can't remember the passage. I think it's in Second Kings as well. Anytime you mention homosexuality, anytime there's a... It is seen in a, an extreme hardening of the heart. And we look at it in, in a little bit in Romans chapter 1. It is a judgment upon God, of God upon the person, and it's a hardening of the heart, and that they have been given over to homosexual, given over to that which is not natural, to that which is against nature, to allow them to defile themselves with mankind, as the AV translates. Let's continue. Male same-sex intercourse is prohibited, and violators are to receive the death penalty. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Other things called abominations in the Old Testament include having sex during a woman's menstrual period, eating pork, rabbit, or shellfish. Well, the issue here is before you just lump in all these laws together, the, the moral law has been there. It is the eternal law of God. It never changes. Uh, Mount Sinai, and uh, we see in is Exodus chapter 20, the giving of the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. These are, that is the law written in man's heart. What do we mean by written in man's heart? Man has been created in the image of God. So he is responsible to keep that law. It never changes. It was the same law in the Garden of Eden. 
Yes, there was the positive command, which is now changed, and we no longer have to obey of, you know, you, sh you shall not eat this fruit, you shall eat that fruit. Um, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life. But by breaking the law on one point, James chapter 2, verse 10, the law is broken in every point. Adam and Eve were in a covenant of works. The, the standard for Adam and Eve is the same as the standard by which we are to be accepted today. And I'll explain what I mean now. Adam and Eve, perfect obedience was required. As soon as they broke that law that was given, that positive command, they broke... They broke the first table of the law, which was to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and soul, and strength. That's a summarization given in the New Testament and in the Old as well of the first table of the law. And to love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, they broke the first table of the law, and in order, and it wasn't very loving of their neighbor anyway for Adam and Eve to influence each other in that kind of way. But the law was broken. The moral law was broken. This is the eternal law of God. It never changes. It was in the Ark of the Covenant. None of the Ten Commandments have been done away with. It is the heresy of neonomianism, antinomianism, dispensationalism, etc. that says, well, that is in the Old Testament. Well, often people who will believe that will say, well, we still have the death penalty, but that's mentioned in Genesis 9, chapter or chapter 9, verse 6. Now, I, I, I realize we're dealing with a liberal Christian here, or quote-unquote Christian, but we... The Bible says in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture, all of it, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture. Otherwise, if you say, well, that doesn't apply to us, how is it profitable to us? Now, I agree. The ceremonial law, which you'll talk about in a minute, he's going to bring in, is done away. It is abrogated. But the ceremonial law taught spiritual truths that pointed towards Christ that are still beneficial today. They are not applicable in that way that there's clean and unclean animals. They were to point towards the fact that there are clean and unclean people. Some have been washed by the blood of the Lamb and some have not. You cannot, when you... The death penalty was always given for those in... It, the Israeli judicial law that was given as a block to the Jews was a death penalty given for violation of what? Essentially the moral law. To blaspheme the Lord God and to disobey your parents repeatedly, etc. and so on. Violation of the fourth commandment, uh, or fifth commandment, sorry. That led to the death penalty. But they're, they're trying to lump in, he's trying to lump in now Oh, shellfish, the air, that's called abomination. But it never says, at least to my knowledge, that there's any mention of a death penalty there. Either way, either way, the, the commands when it comes to food, Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, and also read Romans 14, have been abrogated. The ceremonial law, not the moral law, the moral law never changes. The, the characteristic of God never changes. How will we create an image of God if his law is done away? And when it says, I come not to destroy the law and the prophets, I come to fulfill, Christ said when he came. What does he mean by that? He means he obeyed the law perfectly and he paid the penalty for all those who would ever believe in him, the elect, chosen before the foundation of the world, right? in order that his righteousness, his perfect life, his death, burial, and resurrection, is imputed, his righteous deeds, he, what he, his life. So when he views the believer, the Christian, one who trusts upon the Lord Jesus Christ, 
He does not see our filthy rags. He does not see our failures and our abominations. He sees Christ. He sees, he, he smells a sweet smelling savor, a wonderful aroma. We are no longer, if we are in Christ, we are no longer spiritual lepers, stenches before the throne of God. And if we are, we will live a different life. Why? Because we've been regenerated. We are new creatures. No, not perfect. There will be a battle between the flesh and the spirit, as Paul writes in the end of Romans chapter 7. But that battle rages, and the heart has been regenerated, made new. And charging interest on loans but they're part of the Old Testament law code, which was fulfilled by Jesus. So fulfill means to get rid of. I have come not to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come to fulfill. Fulfill does not mean do away with, to destroy. Fulfill means, well, to fulfill. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. It does not mean his standards, what God expects from us, changes. Now, we will fall short. That is true. Of course it is. But it's still the standard. It Just because, oh, well, you know, we'll never meet that, it doesn't mean, oh, well, we don't have to obey that. We do. Okay, I'm going to skip through this picture because, unfortunately, it's a violation, uh, violation of second commandment. Hebrews 8.13 says that the old law is obsolete and aging. Romans 10... So let's look at that passage. This is really important for us Christians to understand the difference between the moral law that is summarized in the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial law, which has been abrogated, spoken about in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, and other passages as well, but I've dealt with that in other shows. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 13. So he says, he saith that a new covenant, or the, the new administration of the covenant, he hath made the, the first old, the old covenant, the old testament. The old testament referring to the Mosaic economy, the shedding of blood. But that blood shed in the old testament never removes sin. But the blood of the new administration of the covenant of grace, or otherwise known as the new covenant, is, does remove the sin of all the elect from Abel until the end of time. He that hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxed old is ready to vanish away. Now we have to look at the scriptures and see, what does he talk about this vanishing away? Is he talking about the moral law? Because, I would say, where in the Ten Commandments does Ace talk about uh, homosexuality being an abomination? Now, if you look so superficially at the Ten Commandments, you will come to a conclusion, well, it doesn't say anything. But we have to realize the Ten Commandments is not, it is a summary of the moral law. For example, thou shalt not kill, number six. But the moral law is so much more than that. It is positively you sh or negatively you should not kill, but you should also hate somebody in your heart because you've, cr you've committed murder in your heart. Christ goes to that as an example. It's from the heart you obey this law. Uh, we, and we've all broken it. Because we are, we have been born in iniquity and sin. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And if you lust in your heart after a woman, you've broken this commandment. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not uh, bear false witness. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, nor thy neighbor's wife. Covetousness. God is not given. Nowhere is it given the same sex marriage. Actually, any time it talks about his same sex marriage, it's always an incredibly, incredibly negative light. An incredibly negative light. Look at the seventh commandment Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And remember, these are summaries. Of the, this is a summary of the moral law. You have to look at the rest of the scriptures to see the law expanded and expounded upon, which Christ did. Let me 
I'm look at the wrong passage. Oh yeah, sorry. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said of them, by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? So he's pointing back to the moral law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now you say, well, how does this tie into homosexuality? Well, we'll keep listening. And we'll look at this. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, he doesn't mention, he doesn't give a thousand different illustrations. He doesn't say, if you lust after a child, you're disgusting and you're a pervert. Um, he doesn't have to. This is the natural order of things, a woman and a man. <laughs> he doesn't, see, sometimes people want a, a list of a thousand things you're not supposed to do. But the Bible isn't like that. But the Bible does tell you enough to live the Christian life. The thing is, people reject it. They want more, and, they, and that's their hardened hearts. They need to study the Scriptures and meditate upon the Scriptures to what they actually mean. Verse 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. I'll just skip on a little bit here. Uh, verse 31, But it has been said, But it hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, for fornication it is allowed, but for anything else, no, and abandonment as well, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is, divorced, committed adultery. There is no mention man and woman, man and woman. It's not just in the Garden of Eden. It's also affirmed by Christ. Anything outside of that is a violation of that commandment. The well, Let's get it back up here. It's in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 14, the seventh commandment. So, remember that the Ten Commandments are not the entirety of the moral law, but the summarization of the moral law. For example, obey your father and mother is not just about obeying your parents and that's it. Thou shall, you'll obey your masters. If you're in a job and you don't obey your boss, as long as the commandment is lawful, this is why it's important if Christians are in a job they need to be the people who obey their bosses. Like, I mean, I, my main job is as an English teacher, and and I may not always agree with things that are, you could say, you know, said to me, I said, oh, he wasn't nice to me today, or whatever. It doesn't matter. You obey. You may not like everything in your job. You may not like everything about your bosses. But you obey, and you do it, with a willing heart, because think of it like this, to obey your bosses, your employers, is the same as to obey God, because it's to obey his law. To violate marriage and God's ordained purpose of marriage is a violation of the seventh commandment. And in two, and James t chapter 2, verse 10, if the law is broken in one point, it's broken in every point. This is the moral law. To say that this is ceremonial, that, oh, I don't know. There is no thought. I mean, do you do away? I mean, you say, oh, well, the Old, the Old Testament has nothing to do with this. Oh, well, that's the Old Testament laws. Well, goodbye to this much of your Bible. The majority of your Bible is now gone, and this is the danger in such thinking. And sadly, it's not just liberals who think like this. It's not. It's conservative churches. And some dispensationalist groups. Oh, well, it's, it has to be repeated in the New Testament in order to still be binding. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. What is in the Old Testament remains unless God tells you it has changed. God tells us that the ceremonial and the judicial laws have been done away. We can learn general principles from these things, etc. and so on, spiritual truths, pointing towards Christ. 
but these positive additions to the law have been abrogated. We're told that. Verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law. So the old Is this the end of the law? Does, does God have lawlessness? God forbid. Matthew 7, verses 28 to 23 says, For many shall in that day cry, Lord, Lord. I'll actually read it. Because you're just calling for lawlessness unless you explain what the law is. The end of the law, end of the condemnation of the law. You are not under the condemnation of the moral law because the law has been fulfilled in Christ. We still have to obey God, but this is not how we will be justified before the throne of God. Matthew chapter 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my, of my Father which is in heaven. Those that obey God, i.e. those who have been regenerated, those whose hearts have been changed. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, he that worketh. Ye that work, iniquity. Well, what is iniquity? Iniquity, sin, is a transgression of the law. How can you have this if the law is done away? Is there no law anymore? You see, you can cherry pick and jump around the verses and say, oh, that doesn't apply anymore. Hmm. Testament doesn't settle the issue for Christians. But let's look to the New Testament which contains the longest reference to same-sex behavior in the Bible. In Romans 1, verses 26 and 27, people who turn away from God to worship idols are then turned over to their own lusts and vices. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul's words here are clearly negative. But the behavior he condemns is lustful. He makes no mention of love, commitment, or faithfulness. His description of same-sex behavior... Wow, I mean, you could prove anything with this kind of logic. But anyway, let's look, let's look at some of the, um, let's look at the verses in question. From verse 18 downwards, and actually earlier than that as well, until the end of the chapter, it's condemning all those who partake in such things. Now, he's quoting from 27, and likewise also the man leaving the natural use of the woman. Seems easy enough to interpret. The natural use of the woman and the unnatural use of the man. Oh, opposite. So, oh, it's condemning lustful relationships. Why? Oh, it doesn't mention love... It doesn't exist. What is lust? Lust is to want something. It's covetousness. Something that doesn't belong to you. It's something that doesn't belong to you. And unless God has given it to you, and said this is yours, this is over your dominion, etc. and so on, it is not belong to you. And from your heart, you shouldn't even want it. Men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves that recompense for the error that was meet. And even as they did not like to retain, they didn't like to retain God and their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind and to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, uncovetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, etc. and so on. It's giving the fruits... Of a reprobate mind, a mind that has been darkened before God, and a, a, a mind that has been hardened judicially because it hates the truth of God. Talks about haters of God in verse 30, knowing the judgments of God that they commit such things that are worthy of death. Verse 32, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it, that do them. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now,
But look at verse 26. I uh, should have read that, actually. For this, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. He's describing those who are... Reprobate means to be rejected. Reprobate silver means silver does not pass the test. In this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. What are these vile affections? For even their women that change the natural use, which was against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of women. So the natural men is natural with women. And women with men. This is what the passage is clearly saying. Oh, no, no. He's talking about lustful relationships. Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. What is happening in these verses is this. These are vile affections. And what's natural is being turned away from by these people who have been judicially hardened by the wrath of God. It's a sh it shows if this is the characteristic fruit in your life, and it's not just homosexuality mentioned in, in Romans 1, it's also haters of God, which, you know, a homosexual hates God. Uh, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. These are the signs that you are unregenerate, that you do not know God, that you're not in union and communion with Christ. Women with men and natural. Women with women, unnatural. The verse could not be simpler. To twist this verse means you hate what God's word says. It means you, you do not want it. Matthew Vines does not want the truth. He wants to go to his to the Bible and he wants to justify his abominable behavior. Behavior is based solely on a burst of excess and lust. In the ancient world, same-sex behavior mainly occurred between adult men and adolescent boys, between masters and their slaves. There's a lot of, a lot of that still kind of goes on today, what he's mentioning. Uh, there's a large amount of, it's, it's interesting when a lot of these people end up exposing their own groups and their own iniquity, but if you look at the statistics, they're ver much, really, really high. I mean, between young boys and men. Uh, the, the man who started the, the homosexual rights movement, Harry Hay, in the 1950s, he wore a t-shirt that said, Nambla Walks With Me, the North American Man Boy Love Association. Alfred Kinsey, the father of the sexual revolution, who released two books in 1948-1953, which spearheaded and started things like the homosexual rights movement, Playboy magazine, pornography being everywhere now, and his quote-unquote findings, which is a large amount of what this world has based their legitimization of, oh, homosexuality is completely normal, is based upon the writings of a pervert who used, how would I put it, quote-unquote research from people who abused children as young as four months. Don't believe me? Dr. Judith Reisman, drjudereisman.com, I think is the name of the website. She goes through, and she's written extensively on Alfred Kinsey, written a number of books. She's been interviewed in Chris Pinto's The Kinsey Syndrome film, which probably can be found online. You can order the DVD from Amazon.com, or there's also the website, thekinseysyndrome.com, where they go through how... The laws have been changed. If you go back a number of decades to the 1950s, homosexuality was illegal. In most countries, in a lot of countries, it was illegal. Now, Kinsey didn't just try to legitimize homosexuality. It was also pedophilia. That children are sexual from birth. This is one of the beliefs he had. And th this hero, and there was a Hollywood film done with it a number of years ago, Liam Neeson played Alfred Kinsey, the Irish actor. And 
so Hollywood reveres him, the left reveres him, he's the father of sexual revolution, and he dies from the very lifestyle that he is promoting everybody else to live. Too disgusting to mention. This is a vile, disturbing lifestyle. It is not a lifestyle, it is a death style. If you look at the life expectancy and compare life expectancy of homosexual homosexuals with heterosexuals, I think it's, I don't know the exact numbers, I think it's in the 40s. The majority of homosexuals don't live past their 40s. Now, some do. I'm not saying that there are none in their 50s, but there are lots of health issues, we have to agree, that come with the homosexual lifestyle. It is a death style, and sin brings death. If we are loving, if the liberals are really loving, they'll warn them. If any homosexuals listening to this show, I am not saying to you, like in some hateful, cult-like way of like Westboro Baptist Church or anything like that, that, you know, I want you to die and all this. No, I want you to flee from this activity. And trust the Lord Jesus Christ. To embrace and see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. To flee from the shackles of the bondage of the tyranny of your own desires. Of your own sinful heart. And find true freedom in Him. True freedom in Christ. Not more bondage. See, Satan promises liberty. But he really delivers, sadly more bondage. He is a liar and the father of lies. Are we going to listen to him? Are we going to continue to listen to him? This verse is abundantly clear in Romans 1, and I don't really need to go through it any further. But he does bring up, and just to finish off my point, it was saying about, he said, okay, back in the first century, it was between young boys and men. It still happens today. Uh, Judith Reisman did a bit of a uh, did a study on the gay lexicon, which has I think it's like twelve thousand new words. She mentions in the Kinsey syndrome, uh, Noah Webster when he did the uh, Noah Webster's dictionary in the early eighteen twenty eight I think it was. Uh, he did that dictionary and it was twelve thousand new words because, as she pointed out in the film the Kinsey syndrome, that. We are Americans, which is you no know, Webster. He was American. Uh, we're a different people as into the English. 12,000 new words. In the gay lexicon, they, um, how to put it, there's 12,000 new words as well. They're a different people. They're a unique people. And they have 12,000 new words. They did an analysis on the number of words that are used in this gay lexicon. One of the most common ones was were chicken and chicken hawk. Now, chicken is a slang term used within the community of, how we put it, of young boys. Publications such as The Advocate, which is a homosexual publication, all the way to other forms of publications as well, they're non-homosexual, affirm the same thing, that there is a high percentage, I think about 20 to 30 in homosexual publications, all the way up to 70-80%, huge amount anyway, showing the huge number, a large number of homosexual men involved in activity with young boys. I don't even want to go into it even further. There's people who've done the research. Dr. Drew the Reisman has done a lot of this research if you want to look into this further. Also, This whole idea that there are these loving, monogamous relationships in the homosexual community is complete fiction. Uh, Promiscuity in the homosexual community can be emphasized with studies that go back decades uh, showing that 28% of homosexual men had more than a thousand partners. Uh, This is from a study from Bell and Weinberg. I I think this was done 20 years ago. It says 83% of homosexual men surveyed estimated that they had sex with 50 or more partners in their lifetime. 50% or more. Oh no, 83%. This This is the vast majority of them. And 28% over 1,000. It's disgusting. 
43% estimated that they had sex with with 500 or more partners, 28% with 1,000 or more partners. Um, a, another statistic, 79% of homosexual men say over half of sex partners are strangers. Over half, 79%. And look, I've known from people who have told me that in this, basically it's everyone with everyone. There's no monogamous long-term relationships. Yeah, they might stay with somebody for a very long time, but this does not mean they'll be faithful. Faithful means that they will not leave them in that viewpoint. Monogamy does not mean that you will not go and be unfaithful at times. And they are. Uh, in, a, in a 1978 study, 78% of gay men had, uh, had more than 100 partners, 28% more than 1,000. And, and these statistics have been repeated over and over. Uh, this is the quote from Karen, which is a Christian apologetics and research ministry, quoting from a study social organization of sexuality and these are different studies that have been done over the last few decades and there's study after study like this is it's not like cherry picking them or anything like that there he says the following there's an extremely low rate of sexual fidelity among homosexual men as compared to married heterosexuals among married females 85 percent reported sexual fidelity Okay, and we know that there's a huge problem in marriages today. You know, that that is clearly an issue because society has become more and more perverted. This is why they freely have no problem with homosexuality because our hearts, the hearts of the nation has become, have become so hardened. Among married men, 75.5% report sexual fidelity. Among homosexual males in their current relationship, 4.5% reported sexual fidelity. 4.5%. Now, there's different numbers. They might be 2% in some studies, 6% in other studies. The number, <clears throat> and I, I think, to be honest, yeah, and you just have to be very clear on defining what do they mean by f faithful. Because in that homosexual community, Look, you just you just see it. You see with the homosexual community, homosexual presenters on television, homosexual, they constantly, they have a perverted mind. And it comes out. And I'm not just saying it's only the homosexuals are perverted in that way. There are hardened atheists who despise God who have a fascination and almost a an impulse to defend perverted things like pornography. Now... I can speak from experience there because that was the way I was. I was a hardened atheist and I said, well, what's wrong with, you know, pornography and all these kind of things? This was me in the past. I know several people, I can often tell by the way they're talking when they say, well, what's wrong with this? That they have a problem with it and they are completely and utterly addicted to it. It And especially the way they talk about women and they live almost in a virtual world and, uh, so this whole idea that there is faithful, loving, trusting. Look, the, the number of homosexuals in various studies have shown that it's much lower than the fraudulent 10% of Alfred Kinsey, which came up in the 40s and the 50s. Dutch researchers a number a couple of decades later, and Holland is much more liberal than America is, where the original Kinsey reports came from, found only about a 1%, I think it was 1% or 2%, of the population were homosexual. And this was a number of decades after the revolution, sexual revolution. This, the numbers are still not 10%. I don't believe they're anywhere near 10%. Homosexuals are very vocal. And they get airtime, and they get an enormous amount of sympathy. But they're a tiny percentage of the population. Let us return to our video and we'll finish this up. Or in prostitution. Most of the men engaged in those practices were married to women. So same-sex behavior was widely seen as... Where is this in the context? They're, 
compare scripture with scripture, anyone? This is a biblical hermeneutic, not compare scripture with a historical context or something like that. I mean, is scripture enough? If it's not, let's admit it and just say we well, we need loads of other books in order to interpret it. I'm not saying the historical contents won't help, but we need to go from Scripture interpreting Scripture. As Joseph says, shall interpretations not belong unto God? Shall we not allow the Word of God to interpret the Word of God? And he's not allowing this to be done. Coming from out of control lust, a vice of excess, like gluttony or drunkenness. And while Paul labels same-sex behavior unnatural, he says in 1 Corinthians 11:14 that for men to wear their hair long also goes against nature. And most Christians... Wow. Well, he says it's unnatural. He doesn't bring up that he also calls... What, what's not unnatural? What's the opposite of unnatural? Or what's unnatural? Vile. Vile affections. Oh, well, what he says is vile. Oh, let's, let's hear what he says now. Interpret that as a reference to cultural conventions. What? Shouldn't wear your hair long. You're comparing sexual sin and abomination to the length of a man's hair. Now, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's just like, how much are you going to try to get this one in? Yes. There are Christian men who have long hair. Should they have long hair? No. It's against nature. Simply put, and I mean, it's in, it's in 1 Corinthians, people can read it themselves, that women, long hair, men, short hair. Quite simple. Um, now, I'm not going to get into a legalistic thing of how long that is or anything like that. I mean, sometimes certain women can't wear their hair that long. I'm not getting into that th kind of thing. Cultural conventions. There's a certain level of truth to that, but you cannot compare the two. No way. Now, anyway, let's continue. In the last two likely references to same-sex behavior in the Bible, two Greek words, malakoi and arsenikoitai, are included in lists of people who will not inherit God's kingdom. Many modern translators have rendered these terms as sweeping statements about gay people. But the... Abuse, and not modern ones as well. The AV also says abusers with themselves with mankind. Concept of sexual orientation didn't even exist in the ancient world. Wow. So this scene never existed. Homosexuality never existed because the orientation never existed. Are you saying that there's no there was no homosexuals? No, no. You're saying the category didn't exist. See, we didn't create a, they didn't have a category maybe from back then because, well, it was against nature and wrong. And people had enough sense not to f flaunt their sin in front, in public and in parades and everything else. No, it does not mean, let's look at the, let's look at um, a strong dictionary. Let's go to Asenikoits. I think that's how you pronounce it at least. Uh, which is 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind. It's also quoted in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 10, for whoremongers, for them that devile themselves with mankind. And uh, that is the Greek word arsenikoitas. I'm not a Greek scholar, but anyway, it, its definition is one who lies with a male as with a female, sodomite, homosexual. Uh, the ta that's from Strong's and the Taylors. It says one who lies with a man as with a female, sodomite. It's used twice in the Greek New Testament. I haven't actually done, done a look up at how it's trans how the how how any other kind of Greek works. It doesn't need to be done. It's pretty clear. You say, oh, no, it's not talking about homosexuals because the, the orientation didn't exist. 
didn't exist. The practice was talked about in the scriptures and condemned and shown in a negative light over and over again. But no, no, no. The Bible has no comment. It has nothing to say. Imagine this, right? The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. It says it is perfect. It's thoroughly furnished. There's nothing lacking in anything in the spiritual walk. And he has the nerve to say this. It's silent on something to do with sexuality. It's silent on marriage. It's not. It's silent on behavior. And sadly, a lot of people say this, but it's a blasphemous claim. All scripture is well-equipped, thoroughly furnished, enough, sufficient. It's why we call it the sufficiency of scripture. And what is that other word as well he was looking at? Oh, Malachi, the effeminate, Malachus. Says, nor effeminate, nor abuses themselves with mankind. Effeminate. And let's look at this again. I clicked the wrong thing. So. Soft, soft to the touch, bad sense, effeminate. Uh, cat of my boy kept for homosexual relations with a man, a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness, or of a male prostitute. These are the things that's mentioned in uh, Vines, Expository Dictionary. Also in Taylor's Greek lexicon, it states that it means effeminate, of the same thing again, really, unnatural lewdness. This is, there's no... Again, this is like what... This is like what the, home, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Oh, well, it doesn't mean that. The Greek doesn't say that. And it clearly does, and everybody agrees with it. And there's been never any controversy over what these terms mean. And the silly argument, oh, well, the word, the classification didn't exist. But the, the action, the activity has been clearly described. Yes, Paul did not take a positive view of same-sex relations. But the context he was writing in is worlds apart from gay people in committed monogamous relationships. Where is this? Where is this like, where does this happen? So homosexuals have never been portrayed in a positive light in the Bible. It says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It, it says that they've been given over to that which is not natural. It says in, the, in the, the Old Covenant, if a man lies with a man, he will be executed. But this, oh, but there's, are you saying, right, that there are, oh, well, the homosexuals, they are just completely different from the homosexuals of before Alfred Kinsey or the, the 50s movement. Most of the movement and the quote unquote rights movement and this, you know, this marriage quote unquote equality, but it's not that at all. It's really the redefinition of marriage. A lot of the foundation of it is based off the research of a pervert who used research from a one, a Nazi pedophile, Van Balusek. He also used research, quote unquote research. I mean, Here's what this is. And you see, if you're saying, oh, well, uh, being overly harsh to them, here's the thing. You're taking your lifestyle, and most of it's based off of Alfred Kinsey's perversions and these sick fantasies. I mean, and it describes it in Sexuality in the H Human Male in 1948. It was published in 1953, Sexuality in the Human Male. The abuse of children as young as four months old. I think it's table 42. Four month old. And I mean, it even writes down number of orgasms. I even hate saying that word out loud. I mean, this, I don't know if the, the depravity of the sin can be properly explained. And this is the wickedness and the evil, horrendous thing that he is doing here. He is trying to cover a stenching 
corpse and try to present it in a beautiful smelling aroma, it won't work. Because that stench will break through and will override any perfume that you can throw on that. The Bible never addresses the issues of sexual orientation or same-sex marriage. So there's no reason why faithful... There's conditions as well, um, thou shalt not steal. I, I, some people are diagnosed with kleptomania and says, well, they have a natural impulsion in orientation towards stealing. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about kleptomania. It's a, it's an orientation, isn't it not? And like, they can't help it. They just have to keep stealing. You can see how this will go if you follow that line of thinking. Oh, well, you don't want to, you don't want to discriminate against kleptomania. Well, they, they, they rob your, they rob from your house. They rob your car. They rob your, they rob your stuff. Don't put them in prison. No, no, this is discrimination. This is. Well, if you want to follow God's law, that's what it is. It's sin. Homosexuality is sin, and theft is sin. Covetousness, lust. And covetousness, defined in the Ten Commandments, as given to the law of Moses. And it's not just the Mosaic law. Don't get it mixed up with the Mosaic co economy, because it's the republication of the moral law written in the heart of man is to want something that God has not given you. Christians can't support their gay brothers and sisters. It's time. If you'd like to learn more, check out my new book, God and the Gay Christian. So that's the book. I may review that at some stage in the future. If the Lord permits... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, he talks about gay brothers and sisters, and is that possible? Know ye not the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Those who break that commandment, the seventh commandment, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves and mankind, those who live with that lifestyle, should not inherit the kingdom, nor thieves. Should we, if we we're going to follow his logic, well, oh, well, the word thief wasn't used 2,000 years ago, was it? In Paul's time, and, you know, clearly going to steal now, nor covetous. This is the moral law. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But looks what it look what it says about Christians. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. Such were some of you. You were those things, and you're no longer those things. But ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This has been Paul Flynn. Thank you all for listening in. Talk to you again next week.